So, hello, um, first Monday of the month, 6 p.m. CET. Welcome from Munich uh, to the uh, next Airhack, Airhacks uh, show. I got lots of questions, so uh, lots, um, uh, even last minute questions. So, it could be a longer show. So, let's start uh, with the content. And um, so, as I promised you, I um, participate a little bit more in the Java E community. Uh, I was one of the laziest uh, uh, JCP members, and uh, now it's time to be a little bit more involved. And uh, what I did, I looked into um, management spec, JSR 372, and in my eyes, it is the, the most uh, interesting one for me, or the most important one for me. And uh, before we cover this, what I also did, I compiled um, a list of all the specs with um, it was a link direct link to the spec with a link to the Jira issue so you can file issues if you would like to improve Java 8 and with the mailing lists and one of them is the uh, Java e management API JSR 373 so there's a typo in the in the gists and um, I just looked into this and um, and uh, and play with it so what came out so um, actually uh, the spec is already executable so I mean the uh, early draft is executable. What the spec is about, there is a really old JSR 77. So the JSR 77, it came, I think, in J2E 1.4, and it forced all application servers to emit uh, monitoring and um, management data. And what uh, JSR 373 does, it exposes that via a um, self-descriptive, nice um, REST interface, and the uh, Kabia is some, uh, someone from Red Hat implemented that, uh, donated the source code, and uh, pushed the source code to the cloud. So it, it runs on uh, OpenShift right now. So, um, so it is executable. So if you pick the URI, I will post it to the chat. So you can play with it as well. So here is the URI. And um, so if we just, for instance, click at a servlet, you see um, there's a JSON representation of the URI URL patterns, so you can, you know how to uh, how to get to the deployed objects, to the servers, uh, to the uh, to the um, to the to the links. And what's also nice, this uh, management API will also come with uh, deployment API, so you will be able to push wars and um, years, uh, I would say, wars directly to the server. So the question is um, why I like it so much, and the answer is uh, easy. So uh, with the whole DevOps and microservices movement, it is really important to be able to uh, to use you know tools like curl or wget to get basic information about the server. And um, and uh, deployment is even more important because if you are building Jenkins continuous integration pipelines, um, it is really important to uh, or important. It is um, it is really nice to have a, a restful uh, URI uh, with what uh, with uh, on which you can rely on to push your uh, applications. What I, for instance, did in my GitHub account, so I will have to forgot the name of um, I think. Uh, not Lightfish, something with uh, Loader. And what Loader was for, 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 for Lightfish, uh, for Glassfish and for Payara, you can, uh, you can push um, wars using, uh, using a command line and behind the scenes it uses RESTful API. With JSR 3773, this utility would work on all servers. The question is, why I build it at all? Why it's so important to me to have one REST API um, to, to push to the servers? And uh, the main answer is because of Docker, for instance. Uh, what we do in CI, we push with that the application to um, to a Docker image, and this uh, we get response from, from the URI whether the deployment was successful or not. If you would just, uh, in the continuous integration, bundle everything and use uh, the auto deploy folder you have no feedback from the server or you get asynchronous feedback from from the server whether it was actually successful or not so now your homework assignment is look at the JSR uh, this is the typo again so copy and paste 373 restful management uh, look at this participate in the mailing list try, try to play with it and um, contribute code and by the way code what I did the code didn't run on Payara uh, and, and I just um, uh, just adjusted a bit the uh, the uh, the servlet, 
and the uh, the pump, and now it runs on Payara and a glassfish, and it's also part of my of my um, um, of my um, GitHub account. And um, I of course created a pull request, which is going to be accepted by Red Hat. So um, now you can run it whenever you like. And uh, what I did, I created in NetBeans. So I just opened the project in NetBeans to demonstrate to you. So it's really very uh, simple code. It's of course uh, hacked together just to illustrate, you know, how how the uh, URI URI works. And what I plan to do to um, to implement some more stuff on on Glassfish um, uh, v5. Uh, so we offered um, help for uh, for Glassfish v5. What is Glassfish v5? Glassfish version five is the Java e8 reference implementation. And um, what I did in the past, I created a project Lightfish. And what Lightfish is, Lightfish is like um, performance monitor for for Glassfish. And I of course used the internal API. So I would be rather interested to have something standardized and this could be a nice way to contribute some code back. So I offered the help, let's see what happens from the mailing list. Um, uh, I would really like to see going Glassfish v5 forward. So this was the first API. I would just uh, go to the chat. Lots of um, uh, of participants in the chats. Uh, no questions so far, of course not. This was just you know a random topic. So the next one is Jcash. So um, the Jcash, um, what uh, what also happened? I just looked at the J Jcash, one of the oldest JSRs, and what I find out that it was actually split, and the first version only covers Java SE, and it was not meant to be shipped with Java E8, which was very new to me because even in the JCP, in the JSR. Um, abstract, it is mentioned that it's, a, it's going to be a part of Java E. But what I did, I wrote uh, an email to the mailing list and offered um, help and they say, okay, it's not a problem if you hack something for Java E, they will consider this and could become a part of Java 8. And this was the response from Greg Luck. And Greg Luck is one of the um, of the EGs, um, uh, this expert group members of Jcash. And um, now we have it. So um, this is the um, very first proof of concept. This is Jcash Java integration. And the main idea being is, um, so what I try to do, I, I try to adapt the uh, persistence XML because it's very familiar. And the idea is that um, you start with the caches um, element and you can specify one caching provider. What it means, you have to commit, you know, to uh, Hazelcast or, or um, Couchbase or whatever you like, um, or, or MapDB. There are several implementations for the whole uh, persistence for the whole app. Of course, it would be possible to have um, one uh, one provider per cache, but I don't think it's necessary. And then um, what happens here? You can say cache cache name it, and then the cache is going to be defined. And these are the standard uh, properties. Very like uh, JPA has also started properties and vendor specific properties are going to be supported as well. And this actually works already. So you can do this and the cache is going to be defined on the fly. To check it out, um, there is um, created some tests, uh, int uh, integration tests. And I would just like to show you how it actually looks like. So to have a cache, what you will have to do is to inject cache and the annotation name is um, cache context. If you if you skip the annotation, it will just take the name here and use it as a uh, injection point. You see this in the conventional cache injection. So you can just use add inject cache, and then it will uh, inject the caches. Um, yeah, this is what happened with Jcash. Uh, if you like, play with it. Um, I will just post the URI to the chat. So if you like. So someone says, is Jcash is ready for development right now? I mean, Headlands, for instance, um, already uses uh, Jcash in production. And JC2 is another open source project also uses Jcash. What this is, is a proposal um, how to integrate Jcash with Java EE8. And this works already, but uh, it was not pushed to, um, to a Maven repository. I'm still waiting for the VIT feedback from some uh, some reviewers and what's uh, let's see what happens if you like to participate sure go for it create issues fork it uh, do whatever you like you know uh, now it's time to participate i would say and it's of course more fun to do something um you know instead of instead of um hacking the 
47th uh, Hello World project, we can do something more meaningful. Okay. Um, now, um, this was Jcash, and I very briefly looked at MVC and, and the response, but um, it is like um, they are doing well. This was the response from the uh, from the EG, and they say, okay, no help needed. They are on track, and it's going to be to be published. So this was the response from MVC, and probably I already created a screencasts for uh, MVC a spec. So if you are uh, uh, curious, go to my YouTube channel, and you will find it. So it's really nice spec, and I think it's a really meaningful while one. Um, for um, because um, we have already component-based framework like JSF, it is nice to have something uh, more template-driven or, or action-based framework. Okay, the next one. Uh, so I, I thought how to tackle this question. So because it is easy to answer, but uh, not with words, uh, very easy with code. And um, what I did, um, I implemented um, this in so um, and wrote a blog post about this. So, so how to do this is fairly simple. So what you could uh, all um this is the uh, my recent uh, blog post. I will just paste it also in the chat. So here it is. And um, what you can do, what you this is actually a pretty old uh, um, uh, uh, stuff. You could inject the entity manager factory instead of entity manager. The only difference is instead of using I'll just enlarge it a bit. Instead of use uh, this uh, persistence context entity manager, I use persistence unit, and then I can inject entity manager factory. And then, of course, what you can do, you can create the entity manager on the fly. This is application managed entity manager, and you can pass whatever configuration you like. And in my case, I just injected the configuration. Um, then, of course, what you can do, you can inject the entity manager because it is exposed here. And you can uh, configure the uh, the map on the fly. Of course, um, this is a uh, uh, hacked code, so this doesn't make any sense. What you could do instead, use um, like JC2. What this does, you can uh, inject stuff from uh, from Hazelcast, for instance, from a distributed cache, where you could configure everything on the fly. So this basically is, of course, if this is not enough to you, what you could do. Um, you could create, you know, uh, the entity manager factory with persistence, completely unmanaged entity manager, but um, but this is would be like using, you know, a JDBC connection outside of of data source. So this is not, uh, I would say, um, this, this I would consider this as a as a bad practice, not best practice, but bad practice. And this is okay if you really need the flexibility. I have to admit, I, I never did it. Uh, so it was never necessary in projects. What we did instead, we configured in persistence XML multiple persistence unit, injected everything, and then exposed the entity manager with different qualifiers. So this is what we did uh, um, in the past, but we never did this actually, or I never did it in projects. But I hope your question is well answered. And yeah, now go. Let's see what the chat says. Nothing. So the chat uh, is quiet, which is okay. Twitter also quiet. So I got some questions up front from, from Gerson. So, um, but I will cover it later. W what I got, a nice tweet here. Reactivate my Twitter account to watch AirHacks live. This is nice. So, uh, but if someone would reactivate Facebook account, <laughs> this would be weird. But um, yeah, uh, this is really nice from, from, from Werner Jacobs. Okay. So, where are we? So we covered the second question, and actually, I would like to go to the um, to the origin questions to the gist github.com twenty third, and this was the question from HB Omen oh HB Coach. Now the next one. There's a lot of buzz about microservices. I want to understand how we will manage those microservices post production, and what are which common issues uh, we can solve with automation. So I have to admit, my projects, my microservice projects, the, uh, they work like this. So um, someone hires me to introduce microservices. And then we look at the code. So we perform code review first. And um, what we see is like, um, um, so what is the reason they want to have microservices? The reason is because the monolithic application became too complex to maintain. So, okay, so what interests me first is what is the reason 
for the complications. So, and then I look at the at the code, and what usually happens is like, it looks like, you know, um, multi-level, uh, multi-tier architecture without any reasons, with lots of crap. DTOs, mappers, DAOs, service locators, uh, exception mappers. But uh, if you ask why, you get no real answer. So a classic cargo cult programming. So um, what we do then, we delete all the crap, and what remains is pure business logic. So the next step is to look at the POM. And of course, there's not a, not a single war. What we see instead, 2,000 modules, jars, and everything has the same version. So, okay, um, you know, who cares about modules if everything has the same version? There's actually no reason for this. So then we um, um, uh, merge everything together and we end up having one war. So, and after this refactoring, what we find out, the application becomes um, very well manageable. And then we probably introduce two or three wars and then we get our microservices. So it means one war is maintained by a very small team, a micro team, I would say two to five developers. And this basically is. And if, if you get just you know, three or I would say at most five wars, I think there is no issue at all. So um, you don't need you know, fancy discovery, whatever. If I were Netflix, I would use all, all the stuff Netflix provides, but um, none of my project has the scale of, of Netflix, I have to admit. So they are rather, you know, I would say, usual enterprise projects with uh, at most 10 servers or in some cases 30 servers, but this is uh, uh, rather an, an, an um, exception than the rule. Usually, no two cluster nodes, ten, two to 10 cluster nodes. This would be, uh, I would say this is the, the regular, regular stuff. So, and um, about automation, not only microservices, um, I automate everything. Whatever is possible gets automated. So um, in, um, in in current projects we are using, we are of course building microservices. So we started with the automation of everything. So we have uh, scripts for building everything locally. We have scripts uh, which run on Jenkins and Jenkins change everything together. So, the, uh, together. so there is actually no manual step. Also, I created, uh, I built uh, a new hardware, my own, my, uh, a new server and the first thing I did, I automated everything. So um, I can, um, I use uh, Docker Compose on top of Docker. So, uh, so all the Docker services are chained together. And so there is no manual step at all uh, to save time. <laughs> the, 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 only, the only problem with automation, I have to admit, is you forget what the automation is actually doing. So, <laughs> so you have to look at the scripts, you know, frequently. Otherwise, it will appear to, to you like uh, magic, hopefully not black magic, but uh, some kind of magic. Okay, now let's go to the chat. Chat is very quiet. There's lots of participants, but no questions. So, um, we still live, no questions. So, okay. Then now, the next one is a little bit um, longer. Um, so, first one. So, what it is, um, 3T architecture uh, with GSF, prime phases, CDI, EJB, JPA, BNB, and SOAP. Everything seems reasonable, not SOAP, but could be. I don't know, there's probably some, you know, um, external systems which have to be integrated. 10 test tests uh, are testing. So after finishing system tests, I have to deploy this application in the product environment. E yes, uh, or integration test, and then after integration stage product. So usually you have three stages, not two. Um, okay. We have 500 different users. I think branch user. I think branch is a, a, is a business name in banks. Uh, I cannot define capacity planning for this application. So um, I have to run this application on Widely 10 Community Edition. Good stuff. Widefly 10 is very new. Um, I think it came uh, uh, it came this week. So interesting. So um, I think. So how old is the email? 16 days ago and 10. Widefly 10 came this week. So, which um, which is nice, and and I used eight and nine in production so far. They cannot use JBoss ERP for some limitations. Okay. Um, so now now the question: I have confusion. That it's possible to run Whitefly or JBoss in production environment. It is pos po very possible to to run Whitefly in production environment, but you won't get the official commercial support uh, or the officially supported bits from Red Hat. Um, some people say that any open source Java application server is not recommended for production environment. Yes, this is what I would also say. I mean, 
it is really depends on on the intention, right? If I would run mission critical critical stuff, for instance, um, my new hardware, the uh, the operating system. So I actually bought Red Hat Enterprise Linux license because I don't like to care about uh, you know the um, or the security issue. I, I would like to to have my uh, uh, operating system patched. And it is worth to me to pay. It's not a lot, um, so uh, uh, it's not like you know thousands of dollars. It's absolutely okay for one server. So it is cheaper for me to pay for the operating system than you know uh, uh, patch it by myself. So this is what I did. On the other hand, I like to use. The, um, I'm not running the JBoss AIP for my production for my blog and all the stuff I'm, I'm, I'm using on my server because I would like to play with things and, and, and try to do the hottest stuff. So I, I maintain my application servers, you know, uh, because uh, it's the time of my leisure activity. But if I would run a serious business on the application servers, I would absolutely buy the supported bits. Why? Because uh, I would like to earn money, money with uh, the business and not patching the application servers. So um, I would say, you have two options. Either you have time or you have money. If you have money, buy the uh, the commercial supported servers. If you have time, learn about the application servers, you know, look at the bits. And if there's a problem, you should be able to fix the problem by yourself. And hopefully uh, you donate the code back because if you don't donate uh, the code back, um, you will effectively create a branch, which is always a, 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 a bad, in a particular bet in, um, in banking environment. Is it correct or not? I hope I answered this. So there is uh, there there is no correct answer. Some projects run white flying in production, uh, and they have uh, 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 admins who care about the the uh, the application servers, and the others rely on the commercial supported um, supported bits. Is it possible? Very possible. So, what is the major complexity when run community edition server into production when without JBoss AP? There's actually no difference. The only problem is if you encounter some problems, you don't get official support from Red Hat. And the next problem is, um, I think the JBoss AAP, AAP is out now, but it covers Java 7 and I think Whitefly 8 or 9, or, or I think Whitefly 8, I'm not sure about this. So if you're running Whitefly 10, you will have to wait until Red Hat supports uh, um, with AAP 8 or 9 Whitefly 10. So there is, it's not like you decide, you know, s suddenly I would like to have, I would have to have, you know, uh, supported Whitefly 10 from Red Hat. Uh, I don't think it's possible. What I would do, um, just um, ping the product managers from Red Hat or you have some ac accountants and they should help you with the licenses. I have no idea. It's just my experience with Red Hat, but I, I'm, I'm a freelancer. I'm completely decoupled from Red Hat, Oracle and whoever. Okay, I hope you got my suggestion. So either you have time or you have money. Um, so, okay, let's see at the chat. I think we covered pretty well. What is our extra benefit when you use enterprise uh, application server over community server in context of production environment? For instance, you get um, you can ask um, the um, so. If you are if you are if you are running uh, cutting edge software in production, you always will find bugs. With commercially supported server, you get earlier the patches, or you can force the vendor to send you patches. If this is an open source edition, you have to count on community to provide you the patches. So um, check out how how expensive the support is, and then decide by yourself. And also check out how good the support is. So. Um, in the in the past, we have some quality issues with commercially supported software, so it really depends on on the vendor. But um, just just check it out. I I, I think explain it um, um, uh, pretty long. What is actually what it takes, or what is the difference between open source and and commercially supported software? Okay, the next one I will. It would be nice to have Spring Source property source in next EGB CDR release to inject property files into Bean. Um, how to inject properties file into EGB or CDI Bean? So I wrote an article several years ago, Java Magazine with the uh, the US. This is free one. Uh, and oh man, Adam Bean is my name. And then um, it's called configure. Wait a minute, configure the conventional con configuration over convention. I think. Yes, four years ago, 
And this article covers exactly what to do. So I put the article here. And I hope. No, it's not logged in. So it is free article, but you have to register. And I registered, but not on this browser, on, on different machine. So, um, so this is the first answer. The second answer is, if you go to the uh, GitHub account and you search JC2, it's called um, Jcash Configurator for Java 7. What it basically does is the following: can you, the following, you can inject uh, strings, ints, and, and, and floats. And then um, what what it does is it uh, it injects you the values and you and uses the Jcash API behind. So if you're using Hazelcast, you can uh, go to whatever node you like and and maintain remotely the configuration with project like Headlands. So and what you can also do, um, you can implement um, an an um, and and map producer and and preload whatever you like or provide your default values and. Um, so I will just put it to the chat. Um, someone, the anonymous three three six nine one says it really helps to have patches. We have seen many times with IBM WebSphere in production. Exactly, I forgot actually about this. We were in the early Java six times with WebSphere, and uh, in WebSphere we created many PRs. I think I forgot actually the name is PR, like like. I don't know what it is. It's like issues. It's, this was called PRs, and um, they were considered by the IBM engineers, and this was actually great help. But if you would use an, an, an open source application server um, or open source application server, that there is not nothing that there is you cannot use Web3 without support. I think um, so. Uh, it would be completely different story. So, um, so this was the JC2. And then what I wanted to show you the headlands, it exposes the Jcash API over REST API. So, and then you have everything you like. Um, so everything you like. So if you, everything you liked and um, what you can also do, of course, with one liner, you can read here uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, with uh, get class, get resource as stream. And read the property file and, and expose the prep property file as a map, or you can expose the system properties as a map. So it's really really one liner. And uh, the Delta Spike framework provides such functionality as well. So uh, Delta Spike configuration. So there are lots of stuff already. I don't think it is necessary to include this into the standard. Having that said, write an email to the um, write an email to the uh, to the user group. So um, I just put the link to the uh, Delta Spike, and they have lots of lots of stuff. Someone asked me why I see every message from Adam as censored. I think um, because I am writing to 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 too much messages, and I'm using the textual client, and this is this could be the answer. So I'm sending too much stuff into the chat, but it should recover after a while. Okay. So, next one. So, um, the next one is architecture related session. Where should Java files like interfaces for strategy pattern? <laughs> this is a good one because otherwise I would say don't use interfaces. Um, model classes are entities be placed within the BCE pattern. This is a very simple. So model classes are entities, so they they are in the entity package, even if they are not persistent. DTOs, there are no DTOs, um, only on demand. Interfaces and strategy patterns are usually controls or boundaries, usually controls. So they the interface with the uh, Java classes are in the control package. Um, so if one team builds a whole application, including Java e backend, plus pure HTML, CSS, and JS frontend, no Java, um, the uh, question is, should they split it or, 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 or create one war? And this is an interesting one. Th my first reaction is um, ship it together. The experience says usually what will happen, the uh, HTML and CSS and JS stuff will move faster than the backend. So usually you are, you know, um, uh, backend is um, extremely productive. So you, you will just create some REST interfaces and you are basically set. 
and there's lots of tweaking in the front end. So it is have nice to have both split. So you have one front end team which just cares about the wars with the content, and the um, this is the front end team, and the back end team uh, cares about the RESTful web services. And um, and 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 this is nice. So the uh, teams can move independently from from each other. So um, so I would say then split it. So um, I would say split it if you have two teams and uh, and and just look at the and the requirements. If you know the customer is very uh, design heavy, I would say, then uh, split it anyway because they get lo lots of change requests in the front end and the back end. <laughs> back end, back end is nice. Back end is going to be more stable. Um, could you give a short example how to introduce security f to Java EE applications? Uh, There's a good one. I will cover this in, during the next session because what happens in Java 8, there is a lot of um, uh, the security API is actually great. And um, the example, I, I, I wrote an article, Java Magazine, my, oh, the old one. Adam Bean, authentication and authorization let's see perfect so and this is a free article um, which uh, explains what exactly to do to implement authentication and authorization uh, for restful web services so and um, also In my security. So what I also did, there's a sex spike, um, security spike. What I did, I implemented some ideas from the uh, Java 8 um, authentication and authorization to get an idea how, how uh, um, token-based and, and password-based authentication may work. If you look at this, you could get also an idea uh, how how it may look like so and usually usually if you uh if you would like to have more than this like single sign on look at stuff like open am open am this is an old sun project project <laughs> it's a lot of the things and um, the Red Hat one, Key Cloak. I almost forgot it. Key Cloak. So this is if you need more than simple authentication and authorization, which is no more covered by the application server. Okay. So then. Someone asked me, you tell that for open source server, JBoss cannot run perfectly, but in our country, several companies use Tomcat 7 with the enterprise application. Even some people also use PHP plus Apache, which works perfectly for 100 users. But why we cannot use in best practice way? So um, what I got is, I'm saying that he says that people are running Tomcat and PHP Apache without any problems. Of course not. You know the question is again do you have time or money so if you have if you have hey, um, if you have time you could even you know run build an enterprise app which runs on comsun http server so it's not a pr problem it, is, it would be actually a lot of fun to implement everything from scratch but i think in one point of time in enterprise environment it's not about fun it's building um, the simplest possible to, to, to find a simple possible solution to the business problem in the hope it, it, it is maintainable. And in my eyes, Java is just perfect for this. Why? Because you have one, you know, one dependency and, and, and whatever you need is there and just uh, start coding and thinking about the business. Um, with, you mentioned Tomcat, with Tomcat 7, for instance, you have basically just a servlet container, so basically nothing. So uh, just a uh, minimal monitoring and nothing else. So I would say Tomcat or Jetty out of the box are not usable for enterprise applications because the configuration and, and testing and uh, you know best of breed configuration uh, will take you at least uh, half day, one day just to get started. So in, in, in that time, uh, we create a proof of concept with Java 7 already. 
So um, what about Picket Link? Uh, Bukaiko asked me. Um, uh, key, uh, I think Picket Link is going to be duplicated. Use uh, Key Cloak uh, instead. Oh, <laughs> Gerson already answered the question. Thank you, Gerson, for this. So um, to um, M M Gdul, uh, Gulam to Gulam, I would just uh, uh, shorten this to Gulam. Um, everything will work perfectly for you. But um, you have to focus on something. You cannot just create your own stack. The next question would be, you know, should we use an open source um, operating system of not? And the, ne the next question is, I was in a project, not project, I know an, a consultant who created the Linux uh, server from scratch. So there was one operating system, a Linux distribution, which built from source. And it took days until he built a highly optimized Linux. I actually for forgot the distribution. So if someone from chat knows this, just, just put it to chat. It was like, um, um, I forgot it, but it took days to compile the whole kernel. And the at the end of the day, he had a highly optimized kernel, but I know no one cares about highly optimized operating system. So uh, Spring MVC plus Spring IOC plus JPA. Yeah, it's also a way to go, but if I would uh, choose uh, Spring, what I would do then, I would just use the um, officially supported uh, Tomcat versions from the Spring guys called T-Server and not the open source one. Why? It's the same, it's the, there will be the same question again. Should we use the T-Server or Tomcat? I will always go to, go with the official pivotal one. Okay, perfect. So, um, where are we? So, authentication. Someone from, 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 from Africa, and what I noticed, uh, it seems like Java E is very popular in Africa. So there's lots of qu questions, uh, remarks, tweets I get from Africa, which really strikes me. So, um, um, Musua, I'm really glad you asked from Africa. And what I would like to hear is what you're actually building in Africa with Java. E. How popular is Java in Africa? If you ping me, um, I'm, if you have do something interesting, I would really like to, to interview on my blog because, uh, yeah, uh, interesting stuff is going there. Based on your experience, what, based on my experience, uh, I mean, forgot about my experience. Uh, I mean, I spent some time in a project and switched the project. Um, and, uh, you know, I have, <laughs> if I were 400 years old, then I would have more experience. It's just you cannot have enough experience. But forget it. What is the, uh, what is the advantages and disadvantage of saving images file inside a database? I would say some databases are not very well suited to handle large binary formats. And not even databases, even um, version control systems like Git is not very well suited to, ha to handle uh, large blobs. Having that said, uh, a common databases have a particular, I would say, support to store blobs outside the database um, or even combine it with uh, key value uh, stores. Um, I think even Oracle, uh, what, what it can do, it can combine the, uh, it could use the Oracle database for metadata and this KV store, key value, st uh, key value uh, database from Oracle, the open source one, to store binary images. So um, th th this is the problem. So the problem is the database, uh, um, uh, what can happen, the, data the database won't perform well. Also, um, queries, you know, how to, you cannot query for, for, for an image. Um, I mean, what you could do, of course, you can you can store the tags of the image somewhere in query this, but you cannot query for the image in a regular database. There are special solutions, but not in regular databases. Yes, uh, so usually you can store it uh, outside. And actually what I did, wait a second, connectors, and I mean, what I did um, a few years ago, this is um, a connector API, and what it does, it is not very efficient. It's just proof of concept. So I did what I did after the projects. I migrated this, or migrated. I just um, thought what we did in production, and um, I re-implemented in clean room to 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 uh, show the um, the concept. And what I did, it is a kind of transactional file store. So what it does behind the scenes on commit, it saves the data to uh, to a file system. And on rollback, it just uh, flushes the, not flushes, clears the buffer, so nothing happens. So, but you can use this as a, as an inspiration. So, what you could do with that is, in one transaction, you can store to a database the metadata and use this to store to a file system, 
the images or use a different database like NoSQL store for instance to store the images stuff or just use folder as you said it could be good enough in most cases I would just post LFS Linux from scratch? No, it was not LFS Linux. Um, someone from the chat says it was LFS Linux. It has a fancier name. I forgot actually the name of the distribution. It's not LFS. It was a really nice name. Uh, forgot the Linux distribution. It was 10 years ago. So, um, next one. Um, so, how to deploy Java application with Apache web server? And step by step, Tutorial is hard, but what you should look like is um, Apache, of course, and then what you will need is ModJK. And with you, if you search for ModJK, st stands for um, uh, Jakarta Connector, you will find a source code. For unknown reasons, there is no, there are no binaries, so you will have to compile the binaries by yourself. What I actually did. On my server, I just reused the old binary. What I thought about is to create a Docker image which compiles that, but it was not necessary. And then if you look at the worker properties, you will actually pretty fast find what to do. Um, how it works is the following. The Apache server you know, um, knows context URIs. And what, what, it, what this mod JK does is it says, hey, Apache, if you find block, um, just redirect redirect the connection to something else and then you have to uh, to configure the application servers to listen to the port usually this is 8009 what I had to do in SE Linux is to um, open the port and um, and then the Apache will communicate with the application server so this is the old solution a little bit more interesting is the mod cluster from Red Hat and it uses HTTP and comes with own API. So this can be also used, you know, to communicate with the backend. So um, I hope it was step by step. And this is uh, fairly simple. Um, if it doesn't work, usually the issue is SE Linux or firewall, but uh, nothing can go wrong. So if you load the ModJK module to Apache, you are basically set. Okay. Gen 2, exactly. Uh, 6550 Anonymous uh, t told me Gen2. Gen2 was the Linux, and you get a t shirt if you find me, Mac, or whatever, or just uh, write me your, your, your address and I will send you something. So Gen2 was the Linux distribution exactly. And it took you no know, days until he had the optimal solution. So, okay, now you, we spent three days having optimal Linux. Now we could uh, <laughs> compile Apache and Tomcat, and after two weeks, we will have best of breed everything. But uh, <laughs> the, the project is over, and the budget is over, and and we not n didn't wrote a single line of code of business code. So anonymous six five five zero, you are great. So Gen two was Linux distribution. So chat is perfect. And Minix, yes, Minix. I also know Minix, but Gen two was the what I so what I knew. So you see, Twitter is also very active, if they if they know that uh, t-shirts <laughs> t-shirts are in place. Okay, so where are we? I think we cover Musa, and your English is absolute okay. So what's a good way to implement single sign-on with project that only communicates through HTTP? Um, Look at uh, Keycloak, I would say. Otherwise, yeah, you could implement by yourself, but I would say look first at Keycloak or OpenAM and then decide whether you would like to build it by yourself. So um, my question is about monolithic front-end in microservice architecture. I wonder what's the best approach to compose of federated pages in microservice architectures? Are portlets suitable in this case? Oh, man. Uh, I'm not very positive about portlets, but uh, the problem, my problem with portlets is the principle is great, but they are always in misused. So the idea was, you know, management decided to have portlets and everything was a portlet and uh, and uh, the complexity was huge, the performance was terrible and they and no features were used actually from portlets. So um, I, I don't think portlets is the, uh, I mean, uh, could help if they are very used very pragmatically, but usually they are not used very pragmatically. So um, what we used in the recent project was uh, fairly simple. So we had Angular frontend, 
and just the um, Angular uh, services just picked whatever they liked from the backend and, and it worked perfectly. But I get the question a lot. So my answer would be just go without anything, implement a proof of concept with UI, which talks to backend services directly and see whether it works. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work, just create a very simple JAX arrest orchestrator, I would say, which manages uh, multiple services from the backend and see how this goes. But usually uh, what we did, again, it's not like we have, you know, 200 microservices. It's more like we have 2 to 5 or 2 to 10 microservices. And this is actually fairly easy manageable. I hope the question is answered. So um, I got um, uh, an answer from Ulrich Czech, and I think um, the Ulrich attended the AHEX at Munich, so for, I know the name somehow. So um, experience about architectural documentation. Um, do you write, produce something in your business project or this topic left out by the companies? So um, currently right now in the microservice project, so what we do, we um, introduce um, my, one of my current projects like microservice introduction with Java 7 and Java 8. And um, so um, we were supposed to use something completely different. So, so at the beginning, they, 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 they wanted to introduce, uh, I think, Redis, um, Hystrix, and, and Jetty. And after a short hacking session, so I showed them what is possible with Java 7. Everyone was convinced is the way to go. So and uh, what we did, um, we didn't document anything in the first few weeks. So we wrote um, uh, sample code and to discuss, you know, the issues on the code until uh, some patterns crystallized, so what we can do. And then we will write uh, a very simple wiki, you know, as short as possible, this is the point. It should be always as short as possible. The key concepts and what I suggested the first time, so let's see how it plays out. I, I won't write what to do, I will, I will write what not to do. So um, my idea is to write, you know, uh, it is not a microservice if, I don't know, you have 20 layers, <laughs> something like this. Or if you, if you, uh, you know, introducing, if, if you, if you searching for code to use within the microservice or whatever. So um, let's see what, how it plays out. So um, again, w I, I always write something, but this is very short. So usually I would say, I don't know, one to 20 pages at most. And uh, sometimes back then I was forced to write a lots of documentation and um, I think it was never read. <laughs> so um, developers don't, don't read, uh, um, you know, boring stuff very um, because they, they don't like it. So I, I would, the shorter the document, the, the, uh, the more information it usually contains and uh, just go with, uh, with the minimalistic um, option. Okay. So let's look at the, uh, so nothing new in Twitter land and um, in um, chat is also quiet. The next one, which tool would you choose between Maven 3 and Gradle for Java application? For Java E application, I would always choose Maven 3. Why? Because it's the simplest possible solution. So um, what I did uh, for probably for the 100th time, I created a very simple Java e project before the show, and this looks like this. And the good story is it never grows. Actually, even this with the OpenShift deployment is not that complicated. The only reason they have the uh, Whitefield plugin properly for hot deployment, and they have here a war plugin because they would like to have a different name. But um, this is the, you know, the whole Maven configuration from GSR373 official Java E example. It was created by Red Hat, not by me. And this is uh, my example. And this is uh, what I would suggest go with that. So um, Gradle would be not that different. Let's see whether I will find this actually. So um, um, I think, oh, I found it. And I think we already covered is one of the um, examples. And if we look at the Gradle, this is the official or official. This is what I created with Gradle. This is the Gradle build file. And this is the uh, Maven build file. 
So of course, I uh, you know this is not very nice, but if you, you would read this, this is pretty readable. So now we can bu build it with Maven once, twice. It takes about one second. And we can build it here with Gradle twice. And what we learned, <laughs> it takes twice as much. So of course, in more sophisticated project, it, it can be faster or, or, or slower. It doesn't really matter. But um, I mean, I would say both are comparable. It doesn't really matter. But in all my projects, we use Maven right now. And in one project, I suggested Gradle because it was a little bit more special. We, we there were some uh, um, um, automation involved, but developer didn't want it, and they just stick with uh, Maven. But this only counts for Java E projects. If you if you don't have Java E and you would like to to program a little bit more in the build uh, in the in the build pipeline, then Maven would be great. So uh, sorry, Maven Gradle is, is 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 great. Maven is perfect if you can live with the convention. Um, so and yeah, and this is a good one. So and the chosen tool has to support a continuous build and continuous integration system, and this is what what I consider a bad practice. So um, for instance, in Maven, I never rely on the lifecycle hook. So Maven clean install just runs the first uh, unit test. Actually, we covered this. If you're interested in this, so it's just shameless plug. There is continuous Java 7 testing and deployment workshop in Munich, and there's also an, an online one. And uh, what we did, we create actually, and an, 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 we discuss the pipeline here. Okay. So where is here? So what it actually means, uh, build tool is a build tool. It just builds one step. And I use Jenkins for exactly the chaining of the job. So what it would what would mean, I would use Maven. And in the first step, it would be Maven package. The next step would be a Maven phase safe integration tests. The next, the next step would be to use uh, the REST URI we talked uh, before to deploy to the application server. What I forgot to mention is uh, the step before we would build the Docker image and start the Docker image, then deploy the application, then run the system tests, which would check out another project and, and run Maven phase of integration tests again. So um, I, I don't expect from the build tool to have support for continuous integration. This is job from Jenkins. Okay. So now back to the chat because there are some some questions from the chat. Are you any plan to find architectural documentation for architectural reference point for Java applications? We believe several Java programs are already facing this problem. I mean, what do we commit on? What would I would I go with it? This was the this was actually the reason why I invented this or invented boundary control entity pattern. Why I use these names? Because they are well known names in UML community and therefore you know they are uh, known by all UML tools, supported by all UML tools, and don't have to argue what it actually means. And um, so we use that, and the architecture is so simple so that after 20 minutes, everyone knows what to do. And if you are uh, curious, look at my interviews on my blog, and I, I interviewed some projects which use this BCE, and there was like, you know, um, yeah, we started with that, and there were no questions left. <laughs> and the, um, the, the funniest story, or the, 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 the most sad story for me was, I was hired by the Commerzbank to help them with the architecture, and I think I was hired for two weeks, and after one week, they, they said to me, they have no questions left, so uh, they don't, don't need me anymore. They are productive enough without me. <laughs> and um, then I spent one time to implement a stateful project for them. If you're interested in stateful, go to my, um, go to my uh, account. Okay. And if you if you're interested in architecture, go to my YouTube channel. There's lots of free stuff. You don't have to buy anything. Uh, I just I think I have several recordings about the BCE architecture. Okay, next one. Last minute question. <laughs> wow, many last minute questions. Um, using Jaxor as sub resource example, it looks like new transactions aren't created automatically as you would be using stateless. So let's go here. Where is it? So singleton means is this application scope bean. Singleton means no transactions. So he's right. If this were a stateless EGB, 
each public method would start on a transaction. And even if it would return something else, a sub-resource, this method would be already called and transaction would be started here. So if this is a stateless EGB, you get transactions here. Or if this were request scope transactional, you would also get the transactions. But just singleton, and I assume this is a singleton from CDI, there would be no transactions. So he's right. No, if you put um, stateless, you will get transactions. So I think if you do it, just try it. Yeah, you will get transactions. Okay. So um, let's go to the chat. Chat is quiet. Twitter is also quiet. Then create multiple applications inside what you are. Is that possible? So I would li I like to ask you, what is the best strategy for REST API versioning? API v1 on v2. Uh, recurring question. What? It, um, yeah, this is okay if you are in charge of the backend and frontend. If you can implement um, um, influence both, I think versions in URI is the way to go. So if you cannot do this, um, then I won't use the uh, versions in URI and uh, try to achieve backward compatibility uh, with the service. So next question. Uh, are Multiple application one more possible. Yes. So um, multiple resources rest. I hope I will find a blog post. Perfect. So as you can see, perfectly possible. So what you can do, you can specify application pass one and application uh, uh, second and have uh, application pass two and have different resources. So it's perfectly possible. I will paste it to the chat to the, to the chat. So um, Brett Tucker, great question. Brett Tucker is a, a participant from Utah. He uh, he uh, participated in the um, air hacks in Munich. So a uh, nice fellow. So uh, he asked me, do you usually just inject your sub resources into the parent resource? Yes, it's the only thing which reliably works and I pass them to the sub resources. This is not as painful uh, as it uh, uh, like it seems because it's not like we have you know 30 levels of sub resources. So um, I eject it in the main resource and then pass them in um, in construct to the sub resources. And uh, what you can do in JaxOS, I think you can con uh, inject is called con container context or or resource resource context at resource resource context. Um, and then let's say. There should be my IDE should be somewhere. Resource context, right? Yes. And this resource context comes with a method um, init resource, and you can pass your resource and you get initialized resource back. So what this will do, it will inject all JAXRS relevant stuff, not the CDI stuff, but JAXRS relevant stuff. So um, I inject whatever I need in the in the top level. Then pass it uh, in construct to the sub resources and the uh, in the construct uh, and and the resource is passed here and initialized. So this is how it works in Java seven. Okay, thank you, Brett. For the question. Okay, now back to back to browser. Okay, create standalone wars with shared libraries. You can do this. Um, then you don't get it, it, microservice architecture, I would say, so, but you can still use it. Um, but uh, if you, so the question is why you would like to do this. So I think the way to go is this completely different. This is the fourth option if you would like to have uh, um, um, multi version support. Uh, if you would use um, not type safe API to the outside world, something like a JSON, so the new versions can support more and more attributes and, um, and, and you are not allowed to delete anything, but you could provide more and more services. And then you can stay backward compatible without any of this, what you, what you suggested here. Okay. And if you would like to go with the first option, what I would suggest you, no sh standalone share, no standalone wars, uh, sorry, no wars with shared libraries, just put the version one in one war, the version two in completely new war and uh, and duplicate the the libraries because uh, there are two completely different versions. So shared libraries are also always a bad idea in wars. 
Is there a way to send a message to a particular user in a group chat using Java WebSocket API? So WebSocket is uh, like a, uh, a um, topic. So everyone receives that. Uh, having that said, what you can specify is properties, and uh, and you can you can um, you can choose the properties for for pre selections or, or pre filter, and of course what you can do you can also create uh, multiple topics. So this is what you what you can do. But uh, you, um, you, there is there is no the so WebSocket is not 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 a point to point protocol so it's always a broadcast. Uh, okay, next one. How to measure concurrent user of system? So I, uh, we have. So how to find concurrent users in the system? So if you have an app, uh, this is actually a nice one. So if you have Tomcat, so you can you can search uh, for for threats, and and you are uh, and you are set. If you have um, the um, something like Payaro the application server, it is um, a really nice way. Not the users are properly sessions, but uh, the parallel transactions. So what you can do is to look at the uh, max amount of of EJBs. Let's see whether my application server is running. Um, no. But we could start it. So let's start the server. And this was uh, monitoring, hopefully, server, something like this. I always forget the, the ORI, monitoring domain. Perfect. Server, applications, and there are some applications I'm working right now, is just a proof of concepts. And what you should see here, yeah, but this is, there are no EGBs, I think. And no EGBs. If there were EGBs inside, what you would see is, is the number of um, max number of EGBs in pool, the total number of parallel transactions. You get all the monitoring stuff for free. And this is uh, what um, Payara or Glassfish emit. You get a similar, you get similar uh, REST um, monitoring with uh, Whitefly and WebLogic and all, all the commercial servers. So and this is what you get uh, with the application servers and with Tomcat you will have to install additional tools to have such functionality. So um, so back to the to his, his the, the the question is not answered. So um, how to find concurrent users? Concurrent users. Um, so if there are just if this application is stateless, so um, you can you can uh, uh, watch for concurrent transactions and this is the max number of beans in a pool. Um, of live beans and uh, if if the application is stateful this is total amount of sessions okay so and they go uh, it's interesting they they run they they go in production to in april so and and they want to see critical issues http session problem i don't know what do you mean by HTTP session problem? What you can do? Just uh, download JMeter. This is Apache JMeter. Wait a second. JMeter.apache.org. So this is your homework assignment. Download JMeter. So it's the first step. Then hire some students and give the students the JMeter. Tell the students they should break your application. And they, they should generate as much load as only possible and see what happens on the server. So if the server survives their students, so give them one, one, one night, create a heap dump, and then you will see how much memory a session takes. Um, JVM production parameter. So JVM is pretty well uh, set without any tuning. So if, uh, if the heap is sufficient. So I would say assign first, go with two gig to... Uh, for the first test and, and see how many concurrent sessions you can actually handle with two gigabyte of RAM without any garbage collection tunings. If you connect to the application with uh, JVisual VM, so let's try this. JVisual VM, 
so our application server is running let's say we would like to monitor the application so go to monitor and you see here this is the uh, cpu usage we have a heap we have number of loaded classes and we have live threads so um the next morning all all diagrams all curves here have to be flat so if you uh, see uh, increase of heap increase of threads increase of loaded classes you have a problem so this is actually what you have to do now if you would like to go in april to production having that said most projects in in, in europe completely ignore stress tests and they go in production anyway but uh seems like you, you are more careful which is a very good thing <laughs> so exactly and then you could monitor thread pool and connection pool with what with uh, the uh, restful admin so again if you go here 4848 monitoring domain server i think resources timer pool for instance so you you will see here average connection wait time request wait time and connections created destroyed so you can monitor whatever you like with json so what it actually means you can go you know to the to the uri and say curl and you get this as json so you can write nice scripts and uh, uh and, and 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 draw nice charts in in a few minutes and uh you will exactly see whether your server is um is uh is uh, i would say whether your applications case well or so not. for other reasons i had some short internet problem so back to to the show um ui problem one using uh, mvc plus jquery spring I have to say I have no idea about Spring MVC. I never used that, so I'm rather the Java E guy. So uh, there should be a different Spring show. I have no idea. I cannot help you with that. Having that said, let's go back to our chat and see what happens here. So is there an air hacks question? No. Here, also nothing. Uh, Bukaiko asked me Gatling versus JMeter. Then I would use if Gatling versus JMH. So I would say uh, look at JMH. It's uh, it's very nice. So Bukaiko asked me. Let's say you cannot do backward compatible versions. If you cannot do backward compatible versions, just uh, use completely independent wars uh, with redundant uh, libraries inside. so okay then i think we set so it was one of the longest show so i would say um thank you for watching see you of course at the next uh air hacks i actually forgot when they are hopefully not soon because i'm no in april oh, april so in april there's uh they are the uh special days continues and microservices and um, this is in July. And we have also in May, JavaScript for Java developers and HTML5, so nothing to do with Java, but I was asked a lot, so there are lots of at attendees the last time. So we covered hardcore JavaScript and HTML5 with different uh, frameworks principles. And if you cannot come, AirHex.io, there is Bootstrap Effective and Java 7 testing online. And um, thank you for watching. See you next, mo next month uh, with new Java e stuff, new Java e questions. And um, and um, if you if you if you have any questions left, just um, write it to the gist. I will create the next uh, the next gist tomorrow for the twenty fourth um, uh, X edition. It's almost spring, so see you in spring without spring. So uh, thank you for watching and bye. Thank <laughs> you.